got to run. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Deanna Cobruth. She's a runner with the New York Flyers, and she's coached by the great Jonathan Kane. Deanna's a very, very prolific runner. She recently did 130 miles out of a 150-mile course, and we're going to learn all about her tonight. So please welcome Deanna. Hi. Thank you for having me. I really am excited about this. So. Welcome. Let's get started, Deanna, by sharing with the audience a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? A little bit about your family? Something about your schooling? Um, I was born in Georgia, Warner Robins, Georgia. But I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and I lived there for 18 years. And then I went to college at the University of Kansas, the Jayhawks. I'm really proud to be a Jayhawk. Um, and then shortly after graduating, I, I lived in Kansas for a year and a half after graduation and then moved to New York in the fall of 2004. Um, you know, I'm an only child. I just have a mom and a dad and that's it. So very small family. Um, my friends make up my family uh -huh. actually here in New York. Yeah. Were you athletically inclined as a youngster? Not throughout elementary school. I, I did a 400 meter race in sixth grade at a track and field day and I ended up being fifth female overall and my gym teacher just said, you know, you should try track in junior high. And so I did and I didn't really like it in junior high. I didn't have a really good coach in junior high. Um, but some of my friends started doing cross country up at the high school and they said, come along. And I had amazing coaches in high school. Um, for long distance track and cross Great. country. What was the name of the high school? Um, Papillion La Vista in Papillion, Nebraska. Okay. I don't, I don't know if anyone knows about it, but you it's never a good know. School. Our audience spans <laughs> the globe. Yeah, my love of running really came from those two coaches. In high school, yeah, Coach Williams and Coach Cudley, they really instilled in us the importance of looking within ourselves for motivation and inspiration. And they just, you know, they made us really love it. Just for the simple love of running, not mm -hmm. for the competition and mm -hmm. not for anything else, but that we could do it. Excellent. And they believed in us and Excellent. they believed in me and that was a lot. Well, that's important. Yeah, that was my beginning. Um, so what did you major in college? Architecture. It was oh, really? a five-year program. Do you come out with a master's or? Is Just a bachelor's. But it takes an extra year for that. It does, it does. It was really intense. I didn't wow. really sleep a lot in college. So. What were some of the specific topics that you really enjoyed from, uh, from those days? Architectural theory and studio were probably my favorite. Studio? Studio. Uh, design studio where we go and we work, we work on projects and we build models and we present them and things like that. I moved here for the architecture and I came here for an unpaid internship <laughs> with like $700 to my name. I don't uh -huh. know. And I lived in a, an apartment with three guys and it was... It was crazy. It was crazy. My first paying job in New York City was actually being an elf at Macy's in Santa Land. It's at Macy's. It's where Santa lives oh, during okay. the holiday season. And I was an elf. At, you were an elf? I was an elf from the North Pole. <laughs> I'm sure you were an excellent elf. <laughs> that was my first job in New York City. My first wow. paycheck was from Macy's for being an elf. That's pretty My darn. name was Jingles. <laughs> That's pretty darn good. Yeah, it was really fun. And, and so you said... You weren't running in, in college? No, I played lacrosse in college. I was a jogger. I'm a terrible sprinter, and I was a very mediocre lacrosse player, uh -huh. but I had a lot of fun, and I loved my teammates, okay. so it was great. Okay. Um, you first really run that really said, this is going to make a difference for you. Probably my first marathon, which was the Miami Marathon in 2009, and I had picked that marathon because my grandmother lived in Miami, and you know, she was getting on in years, and I just wanted her to be there. And unfortunately, she died um, about two weeks before the marathon, oh, so, so sad. she didn't get to see it. But she was there. She helped me in spirit. When I hit the wall at mile 20, I was screaming and throwing a tantrum, and um, just <laughs> I lost it and was screaming at the sky, "Why? Why is it so hard? Help me, Grandma!" And she was there. My mom and dad were there too, so oh, okay. that was nice. I did not like how I felt <laughs> at that marathon. I didn't like that. It was hard. I mean, I knew it was going to be hard, but I didn't like that um, I was broken, and I, so I wanted to try another marathon to see how it would feel mm -hmm. to do it well, <laughs> or at least not feel like I was going to die. Okay. Um, so I, I picked a trail marathon in California, the Big Sur Trail Marathon for that September, and I would actually <laughs> um, had signed up for the New York City Marathon as well that same year. 2009. 2009, okay. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along there, I started getting into ultras, and I also signed up for the Knickerbocker 60K for wow. 2009, and I 
signed up for my first 50 miler to be the same week of my 30th birthday in March of 2010. Um, and I also signed up for my first 100 miler, so. Well, wait a minute, that's a, that's a <laughs> lot of big jumps. So you went from a 26.2 to the Knickerbocker, which is about 36 miles? 37. 37 miles, mm -hmm. this is in Central Park. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to go beyond the 26.2? I wanted to go beyond because I had come across this organization called the Somali Man Foundation, and I came across it through a friend of mine who did a photo story on it, Jennifer McFarland. She's an amazing photographer. And she brought photos back and did a show for it. And there was a picture in particular of a young girl who had survived being sold into the sex trade. And she had survived being in a brothel. And it was just a picture of her arms and turned out like this. And they were all cut up and scarred from beatings and from her own suicide attempts. And um, I had to leave, actually, because I had to compose myself. It hit me really hard, and I was about to cry. Mm -hmm. You know, from that moment, I became really interested in the organization and what they do. Living in the U.S., I, as a woman, have rights, and my life is considered one of value. But for 27 million slaves around the world, their perception of reality differs drastically. They have no rights, they have no freedom, and they have no voice. These girls are raped, they are tortured, and they are forced to endure an inhumane reality that none of us could ever imagine. Human trafficking is estimated to be a $12 billion industry. It's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. More than two million women and children are sold into sexual slavery each year. In Southeast Asia, girls as young as four years of age are sold for as little as $2 and then forced to service up to 30 men each day. This is a global crisis and it must be stopped. These girls can't fight for themselves, so we must fight for them. So Somali Mam was actually a victim herself, and she was sold at the age of 12, and she was able to escape. And instead of leaving the country altogether and never looking back, she came back to help other girls like herself. Um, and she's done so much. She's so amazing. Came back to Cambodia. She came back to Cambodia, and she had the strength and determination to face other um, brothel owners and to rescue girls who, had, who were going through the same situation she okay. had gone through. Okay. So from that, I met a man named Benjamin Skinner who wrote this book called A Crime So Monstrous, and he had spent six years researching human trafficking. And I bought his book and he signs it. I had asked him, well, what can I do to help? I'm just an architect. And he said, no one is just anything. You know, you find something that you're passionate about, that you love, and you use that to change the world. Um, so he signed my book. He's like, to Diana, an angel of light, not afraid to look into the darkness. I took that as a compliment until I read the book. And at the end of the book, there's a Henry David Thoreau quote. And it's along the lines of, who are you to have judgment as an angel of light on the outside, looking in, pondering the deeds of darkness. So by calling me an angel of light, he essentially challenged me to actually step up and do something to okay. fight human trafficking. Taking action can mean anything from creating online awareness campaigns, hosting grassroots events, or marathons and bike rides. What can you do? The only thing that I knew that I had was that I love running, and I love running long distances. So that's how I said, okay, these girls can survive being beaten and sold, and they can survive the most trauma that you've ever heard of, and they can move on, and they can live lives of happiness. What can I do? I think I can run 100 miles. I did a 50 miler in March as a birthday gift to myself, okay. as a training run for the 100 miler. Okay, the training um, run, okay. Right. How were you doing this I was on just, your own? I was just doing it on my own. I was researching online. Um, I was reading blogs of other ultra runners. I was inspired by Scott Jurek, like so many other people. Um, things like that, yeah. Everything that I found out, I found out online. Wow. Mm -hmm. How did your first 100 mile go? It went really well. It was the Burning River in Ohio of mm -hmm. 2010. And I, I finished in 22 hours, 22 hours and four minutes. That is an excellent time. Um, so you probably got a belt buckle for that? I did get belt buckle. I did. I did. It went really well. I, you know, I learned a lot. I learned that I need to eat more and I should take in salt because I started hallucinating around mile 85. It was, <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, it was a really bad hallucination, but, you know, a But you managed somehow. You managed. I guess you had a crew with you, right? I did not have a crew. 
I did not have a pacer. I did not have a crew for this. No. So, well, <laughs> I did everything by myself on this one. To make it very difficult for you. <laughs> no, no. Um, the Burning River. Um, it's a it's a great it's a great beginner 100 miler. Okay. And I, I don't want to say it was easy because it's still 100 miles, but it's really really well organized. Okay. And aid stations are never more than seven miles apart. They're mostly four to five miles okay. apart, which is very, very doable. Okay. And the aid stations are great. They're, they have tons of food, tons of drinks. Um, the volunteers are amazing. You know, at mile 60, this volunteer named Nick Bullock actually changed my shoes for me, and I refused to sit down, so I had to lean on another volunteer, and he had to get down into the mud and just, like, take my shoes off for me. I mean, that's, that's great. That's, that's like, great. I had nobody else. I didn't have a crew, so I'm a complete stranger. He's a complete stranger, and he was like, sure, no problem. I'll change your shoes, whatever. Wow, sure, you don't want to sit down. That's the beauty of marathoners, okay. and particularly author marathoners. You get that extra camaraderie. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was ex extra special because I had used that as a fundraiser for the Somali Man Foundation. So I had that to like motivate me because I knew that a lot of people had donated to the cause and they were expecting me to finish. And you know, I, I have bracelets. Um, these are Akun bracelets that are made by the survivors. What do you call them? Akun, A-K-U-N. It's uh -huh. the Cambodian word for thank you. Oh. And, um, the girls go through re rehabilitation, so they learn skills like weaving and sewing and um, hairdressing, and they they learn how to apply makeup. And one of the first things they learn is how to make these little friendship bracelets. And um, so these are handmade by a survivor, That's and I had these in the race. And so sweet. Yeah. So yeah. I guess they, they, they mean a lot offer to them me. for sale to help uh, they do. support the cause. That's excellent. Yeah, they're $15. It's, not, it's a great well, price. Well, they look great on you. Oh, thank you. you got a great time, even though you started hallucinating at mile number five. <laughs> yeah. But you learned a lot. So what's, what was your next uh, physical challenge after that? I did the Black Hills 100 miler up in Sturgis, South Dakota mm -hmm. in the summer of 2011. Okay. Actually, and that <laughs> was really hard. <laughs> it was really, really hard. Um, it had 18,000 feet of climb, and the trails were really, really technical. Um, and it was at 4,000 feet above elevation, so it's so what's a technical trail? Very rocky, ah. very, very rocky in roots, and it's hard to step flat and everything like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of single track that was rocky as well. Okay. I was better prepared. Um, I underestimated what 4,000 feet above elevation means because I knew I wasn't going to get altitude sickness. Um, however, I did not really understand how much thinner the air would be oh and God. how much hotter the sun was going to be. So I took a beating quite early on. Um, my stomach got really upset and I couldn't eat any solid foods for the last 40 miles of the run. So that's another race that I was hallucinating at. And I was hallucinating paparazzi in the trees and I was hallucinating small buffalo in the course and um, well, it was kind of crazy. Were you hallucinating? Uh, what are you, do you know you are or you, but you still keep going? Um, the paparazzi, I did not understand that I was hallucinating until I think the end of the race when I asked my boyfriend who had jumped in for the last 17 miles to save me because there's no way I would have made the cutoff time without him. Um, I said something about it and he was like, what? What? Paparazzi? <laughs> what cameramen? Well, what do you know? Diana, there were no paparazzi on the course. And I was like, oh, right. So, hallucination. And the small buffalo, um, I understood was not a small buffalo because he was ahead of me and I saw it and he didn't mention anything about it, you know? And I was like, oh, that's weird. Why didn't he say anything about that buffalo that's on the side of the course? And then I passed it and I was like, oh, because it's a tree stump, it's not a buffalo. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I guess you were very fortunate that he had a pacer. For that there, one, yeah. For the last 17 miles. Yeah, we hadn't planned on it because um, I, I didn't think I needed one. And he also is not a distance runner. So he had never gone over, I think, like seven miles at that time. Very maybe, good. maybe. I could My be wrong. God, he sounds like a keeper. Yeah, <laughs> he's definitely a keeper. 17 miles, wow, that is amazing. Yeah, he, he I helped guess he, me. he knew you needed it. He did. Um, <laughs> He describes moments of me stopping on the trail and like looking down and like shaking my head and talking to myself, which I don't remember at all. But yeah, he got me wow, through it. Wow, but this did not discourage you because I know you went on to even longer distances. So what was the challenge after that? Um, well, I just, last weekend I ran, or attempted to finish 150 miles. It's called the McNaughton 150 and it's a peak race. 
And so... Now, where is this? It's in uh, Pittsfield, Vermont. And Pittsfield is just outside of Killington, which is a big ski place. Right. Um, so now, this is now 150 miles. 150 miles. Even though the 100 miles was seemed like a lot of challenge, you now went a step beyond. I did. Um, How because did I was you more prepare for that? I ran a lot. I trained a lot. I took meticulous notes about my diet. Um, you know, and I, I reviewed what had gone wrong in, in Black Hills. And was, most of it was diet. Like, I didn't eat enough or I didn't take in enough salt or, you know, or I started off too fast or... When you say you Something. didn't eat enough, that's during the race? During the race, I didn't have enough calories. I mean, when you're hallucinating in a race, it's something to do with the lack of calories in your body. You know, your brain is misfiring because it doesn't have enough sugar or salt or something's going on. Why did you pick the 150? It's one of the only 150 milers in the country, For first of all. Um, second of all, I have a friend named Harvey Lewis who was at Burning River at my first 100 miler, and it was his first 100 miler. And we met and we talked, and he was actually training for Badwater, and he was also training for the Spartan, the Spartathlon, which is 153 miles in Greece. So, I mean, he just he just kicked butt, you mm -hmm. know. And I was so inspired by that. By you know, I was with him at his first hundred miler, you know, and it was incredible to see this like trajectory that he went on, and. Um, Another friend of mine who I also met at Burning River, that first 100 miler, this, this man named Mark McCaslin, last year he just posted on my wall the link to this McNaughton race and all he said was, you should do this. You could do this. And I was like, all right. I'm there. <laughs> cool. If you're doing it, why not? Wow. Oh, man. But how many yeah. people enter that? Um, 150? Well, the thing is that this race, it's a 10 mile loop. and. It's a trail race, and there's also a 500-mile race on the 10-mile loop. That's They have 10 days to finish that. There was a 200-mile race, and they had 72 hours to finish that. The 150-milers had 60 hours. The 100-milers had 36 hours. So there's all kinds of races going on my, just on this one continuous goodness. loop that we would go on. Um, so there was, I, I do believe there were five 500-milers that started. Two of them reached 500 miles. One of them reached an astounding 370. And then out of the 200 milers, I want to say there was like 10 200 milers. I'm not quite sure. My brain is foggy from okay. all the stats. But none of them were able to finish um, because it was a really, really difficult course. And actually, the 200 mile race was more difficult for many reasons than the 150 mile race because they technically had to keep a faster pace than the 150 milers. Because the cutoff time was a little shorter. Well, they had 72 hours, but to finish that. In three days, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really not a lot of time. That's right. You know, they had 12 extra hours to go 50 more miles oh, than I goodness. did, okay. which is insane on that course. It was, so, the, you know, most of them reached between 100 and 140 miles, which is astounding. Wow, well, this incredible, sounds like incredible. Uh, it's meant not to be finished. It's, it's meant not. to really be a challenging, nope. <laughs> spiritually enhancing course. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a DNF course, and it was brutal. Um, the inclines were incredible. And you know, you'd get to the top of the mountain, and you'd look out, and it was all worth it, especially at nighttime. The first time I got to the top of the mountain at nighttime, I turned my headlamps off, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. not New York City. It was complete said, opposite oh, of New York my City. My goodness, so you would recommend this? I would recommend it, but I would recommend it for anybody who doesn't mind being beaten up and who doesn't mind getting a DNF because you got to go in so it's really expecting. for the experience yeah you got to go in just knowing that you're going to go as far as you can and that's it that's, that's a um, wonderful I was hoping for 150 well, that's, a, that's a very unique uh, definitely a unique race it was very very unique yeah it was, there was some bushwhacking bushwhacking <laughs> yeah there was oh my gosh it wasn't a trail there, it just wasn't a trail it was bushwhacking through something that was supposed to be a trail. And it had rained um, continuously for like two days right before the start of my race. So there was angle deep mud. Oh, my my feet were never dry. You know, oh, I had to switch goodness. constantly to avoid trench foot. Wow. Was Jonathan Kane involved in your training? He was, yeah. I mean, he wasn't specifically geared toward that. He was, he spent a lot more time um, getting me ready for the Boston Marathon and for shorter distances. And he does a lot more for me for duathlons that mm -hmm. I attempt. Coach Kane is amazing. My name's Jonathan Kane, and I coach runners. He's always very encouraging and gives me confidence when I, I think I'm a little bit less than I am. 
Um, he's very good at seeing the potential in runners and telling them about the potential in mm -hmm. runners. Mm -hmm. And um, just some of my teammates have seen them do great things because of his guidance. And um, he also has this wife, uh, Nicole Sin Kui, who just recently qualified for the world championships in the duathlon. So world championships. World championships. That's a um, great honor. About, yeah, and she just gave birth to a baby. So she's pretty <laughs> she's pretty tough. And just getting to like train with people like that is very, very humbling and very inspiring. So that's another thing that he does for me, like getting to run with such great runners. When did you join the New York Flyers? Tell us about that. Um, it's a wonderful organization. I, I started running with them shortly before my first marathon in 2009. Before I, Miami? Before Miami. Mm -hmm. A coworker. I didn't officially join until February, like the, paid the membership and everything. But I met them and ran with them um, a few times before Miami. Marathon. And you've been running with them ever since? Yeah, I love them. They're great. You know, they loved me when I was a 10 minute miler, and they loved me when I started to get fast, and they're going to love me when I start to slow down. So, <laughs> yeah. Lowly slow down. <laughs> you know, if, if tomorrow, you know, I can't run fast anymore, I'll still be thankful for the time that I've oh, had. You know, so. it's, running isn't about speed, it's about, like you said, it's about the motivation, the right. camaraderie, mm -hmm. it's about other things. If speed is there, you know, that's just a nice bonus. Yeah, it's, a, it's the icing on the cake. So. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. So let's talk about a little bit about New York, uh, New York Flyers, I should say. They're part of New York Runners, right? Mm -hmm. Do they meet on a regular basis? Do they have Saturday runs, long runs? Monday night runs are downtown, and we run along the West Side Highway. And the Saturday morning runs are in the park. Um, they usually meet at 72nd Street. Central um, Park. Central Park, sorry. Central Park, yes. We do have Riverside Park. We do have Right, Grand there's so many Park. other parks. So many other parks. It's not all about Central Park. Okay. But um, they have Tuesday morning speed workouts, and there's other speed workouts throughout that you, you can join and pay for. Um, the Tuesday morning ones are free. That's one of the biggest groups in the city. Mm, they're great because there's and a reason for that. They're awesome. They're awesome. <laughs> they're also famous for their end of season party, I guess, the holiday parties. The gala. Yes, right, the yes. award ceremony that's held yes, in Jello. Uh, my uh, chiropractor, Dr. Mark Bachner, he goes to that and he he never misses it. It's, it's a most be a great party that he always goes. Mm. Everyone gets dressed up in the tuxedos and fancy dresses and we're not smelly and sweaty and it's right. fantastic. We're happy to, you know, promote them here at the program. Yeah, go Flyers. Great. <laughs> now, I think you're doing another, another program, a Girls on the Run or something like that. Tell I us am. about that. Um, Girls on the Run is a program for girls in third grade through eighth grade, I believe, and it was started in 1996. And it's basically a program to teach young girls about individuality and team sportsmanship and um, community. And what it does is we have like a little lesson plan at the beginning of the class. It's a, sorry, it's an after school program and it's volunteer based. Um, so we create these teams of girls at these schools and there's a little lesson at the beginning and we go over topics like what to do if someone's bullying you or uh, what does inner beauty mean or what are healthy foods that you can eat and or how can you get your parents to buy healthy foods and things like that and uh, we teach them about teamwork and what it's like and it's not always about winning you know you don't have to be the first one across the finish line um, and the community is how can you influence other people in your community with what you've learned. And it's an amazing program. It's my first time uh, just this past season working with them. And to have 32 little girls like running and it's amazing. Like one of the, little, they made a sign for me for when I came back from my race and um, it almost made me cry because they were like, congratulations on your 150. And this, oh, really? Yeah, and this one little 10-year-old girl said something to the effect of, when I grow up, I want to run 152. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I had to, like, I had to like look away and be like, okay, don't cry in front of these little girls. But, you know, and they're, they're so, it's so fun to know that I'm helping to influence them in a positive way, to, like, make them love something that I love. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And... Um, to inspire them just to be healthier and um, just be active. That's you know? great. That's great. Now, do yeah. you run with them at times in Central we do. Park? Oh, no, we don't run in Central Park. Well, every program is different depending on what the school has available. At my school, um, PS134 in the Lower East Side, uh, there's no track. It's an elementary school. So we go out on a basketball court that's fenced in, and 17 laps around the basketball court is um, one mile. So we play games, you know, we play tag, we play relay games. Um, we, uh, the teacher, Ms. Shulman, who's the head coach, actually created a ladybug boot camp where, you know, we make them do squats and star jumps and things like that, which they really, really love. And um, yeah, we run with them when we can. 
And excellent. Yeah, excellent. it's fantastic. And they, they want to hold onto your hand and like run with you. And really? <laughs> they want to pet your hair and they want to hug you and um, they want to hear about how you run and everything about it. And oh, it's, that's so, it's so, so inspiring. Fun. That's it's so great. fun. <laughs> that's great. And, and hopefully, uh, I guess schools uh, apply to be part of your organization. Uh, I mean, how do they, they do. find um, Girls on the Run? Well, I think it starts usually, I think with Ms. Shulman at, my, at the school that I'm at, um, I think she had heard about it. So she went to the Girls on the Run program and to her principal and said, hey, can we do this? Yeah. Um, it's usually one person at the school who yeah. reaches out to Girls on the Run. And sometimes I think Girls on the Run will find schools and offer to help them set up something if they think there's a need mm -hmm. for that type of thing. How is Girls on the Run funded? It's, you do fundraising for them? We do fundraising, lots of volunteers. Things like that. Oh, for example, so they have entries to the, for the New York City Marathon. Is that they do. Mm -hmm. They have oh, okay. a team for that, actually, right great. now. It sounds like an excellent program. It is. It's great. And I think you also got involved with a, a, a new program that came to New York City called Back on My Feet. Yes. I just started with that as a, as a non-resident runner okay. in the mornings, 5.30 in the morning. Which uh, shelter do you go to? Um, it's down on Bowery. Uh, I can't remember the address. I just know where it's at. But it's the Bowery Mission. That's okay. what it's called. Um, Five thirty in the morning, you got to be there and start. And I guess you do a mile or a mile and a half. Something. It just depends on the day. I think the coaches will start getting up to four miles. They just did a four mile race for some of the residents this past weekend. Yeah, Japan run, I think. I think so. Yeah, yeah I was. Yeah. I was it was gone, the first so. time. I'm part of that organization as well. I'm going to have uh, the uh, the founder of Back of My Feet as a guest, a oh, future right. guest. So we're going to be talking about that program in detail. Oh, it's so wonderful that you're part of that. Yeah, so this started. is a program that helped homeless people to get back on their feet. Right, people so, experiencing homelessness. That's right. That that's is what the it is. Uh, maybe to politically correct way, people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. that is a, that's a wonderful way. We're almost out of time. Oh. <laughs> But I want to thank you so much for dropping in and sharing these great stories. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.